IBM CEO Arvind Krishna was one of the main speakers during the opening day of LEAP 2025 in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. The interviewer didn't spend too much time introducing him, but simply reminded us that under his leadership, IBM has doubled its market value. The success is attributed to Mr. Krishna's qualities as a leader, particularly his ability to identify signals that anticipate major shift in the industry. In a previous video, for example, we saw how the leader of IBM saw his vision come true with the sudden arrival of DeepSeek. Now, during LEAP 2025, he sort of recaps the signals he noticed. Take a listen. Look, I'll point to you. You're right. We have to look at trends. And if you're after a trend, you can leverage it, but you're not going to get a lot of value usually. So what His Excellency is talking about is picking up faint signals. Something is happening. Is there a technology community excited? Are there some very early adopters who are just waiting to get to it? And I'll point to three very simply. I noticed a couple of the announcements, people use the word sovereign. Mm. I'll use the word hybrid, but it means sort of the same thing. People want to have control over some things. They might be willing to let some things run elsewhere, but you have to have this capability for sovereignty and it gets enabled through what we would call hybrid cloud, which is also a word that got used. We picked up that trend about seven years ago, and we now have the leading portfolio in that. We are very happy to bring that to the kingdom, as His Excellency and other people in the room know, that's one early one. AI, look, people are excited about AI, but AI for numerical purposes has been used for 20 years. So what we should be careful of, the reason for the excitement is that AI is the closest we have come to be able to read and to be able to understand what may be behind everything that we read. The word understand may be a bit too much, but it does a pretty good job of uh, getting there. I think that is very exciting. And the reason His Excellency mentioned deep seek, I have been a believer and I have said to His Excellency for two years now, I believe the cost of training will become 1%, so 1 over 100 of what it used to be. And I think DeepSeek was a proof point of that. And I believe the cost of inference will be even lower than that. It'll be less than 1% of what it is today. You bring all these together and you suddenly are going to democratize AI because you can build models in different places and you can run them everywhere. This isn't just theoretical talk on IBM's part. The company, in fact, has its own large language model called Granite. This slide, presented during an AI conference in Paris, summarizes the main features of the model. In summary, Granite is a family of models that IBM has created to be safe, efficient, scalable and, of course, open source. The model has to be open source to allow users to modify and adapt it as needed. It also needs to be scalable to give users more options. Here are some of the models of the Granite family. We will provide more details at the end of this video. IBM also believes that an open ecosystem with lots of choices allows experts to customize models and create differentiated models for various capabilities. Here is how Harvin Krishna explains it. The first, which I think is very underestimated, Right now, all the fascination is with these large models that serve everybody. Mm. I'll call them, and the world of technology has shown that those are always very powerful and well used. Currently, domain-specific models are only 1% of what is used. By domain-specific, I mean something which may be used in a steel mill, something which may be used for upstream oil and gas, mm -hmm. something which may be used in an industrial process. That's a domain-specific. We believe in the next three to four years, those become over half of all deployed models. That is an area we all have to go innovate. To make it correct, what is the area on how you train these models? How do you deploy these models? How do you run them? But most importantly, how do you begin to bring domain knowledge on top of base models to begin to get that? I think that is a really big and important area that is going to come and that is going to fundamentally transform how things work. To understand why IBM sees the future being more domain-specific, we have to go back to the conference in Paris for the latest updates. 
you know, if we look then to the next opportunity, um, you know, we've been training our models all on public data. And, you know, I think you could argue that basically all of the public data that's out there has been, been put into models, you know, in one way or another. But if you actually look at the data that's in your own company, like almost none of that's ever made it into models. Hopefully it's not much of it is in public uh, models because that means your data got out in the public somehow and somebody slurped it up. Um, so we think that's a huge opportunity because this is the real competitive differentiation of any business is, is you have your data, you have your know-how, could you use that? And that's what this project in Struct Lab does. So this is a very similar idea, except it doesn't require any coding at all. Uh, you can do very simple sort of give examples, amplify that with synthetic data generation using LLM workflows. And you know you can basically then create a master set. And the key here is not so much anything about the technology. There are a few details about how the training is done that makes it work a little bit better. But really the key thing is that it makes it, makes it all easy and turnkey and automated. So, Subject matter experts don't have to learn anything and they can, can just focus on outcomes. And why is this important? It's because if you can take a model and customize it knowing your company's problem, your company's uh, data, um, you can actually perform a task incredibly effectively. I'm just going to, for the sake of time, focus on the last uh, row on the right, where basically this uh, it was a North American telecommunications company. They were doing a task where they were taking chat transcripts, uh, customer service transcripts, and then asking 80 questions about it, which had, which drove business value. Like, was there a technician sent out, or did the person mention a competitor? Things that would be interesting for them to know, so they could could do, use it for sort of their own operations. The performance of the model, um, they were using GPT-4 to do this, at a cost of you know mid single digit millions of dollars. And by simply customizing a 7 billion parameter model on their data, not completely shackling it to that task, but giving it just a little bit more information about what the company wanted to do, they could make it 93.6% cheaper. So almost 20 times cheaper, because uh, you're using this little model that's, that's again, it, it knows your company, but it doesn't necessarily you know, know advanced physics and all that. So this is a huge um, you know, potential cost lever. And it also transmutes you from being sort of a passive recipient of the technology, all this exciting technology, do you want to be a re passive recipient of it or do you want to be part of the creation process? And I think that shift is, is something that open source and open communities can enable and that's something that we're very passionate about. Now, IBM is also a pioneer in quantum computing, so the question about its availability was, well, inevitable. Before listening to the current answer, let's go back to 2022 when Arvin Krishna was asked the same question during the World Economic Forum in Davos. 2025 would be my prediction. 2025? Not that far. No. We're still on the timeline, so we're at 400 qubits today. That's on the cloud. You can go ahead and use it. By the way, a real quantum computer, not a simulation, not something virtual, a very real one. So in theory, we should have some major news this year but it is more likely that we'll still need to wait two or three years for a significant quantum innovation. Take a listen. Stick to my prediction. In three to five years, we will see something amazing on quantum computers. I'll give you a couple of proof points. One can imagine people like the University of Chicago, the National Labs, University of Illinois, State of Illinois, kind of are serious people. They think about their investments carefully, like the kingdom does. And they're putting a lot of money down for a national quantum algorithmic center in Illinois. I'm hoping that we'll duplicate some of those things here also. But they want to see what problems can be progressed in the rich, rich area of materials and financial risk. But the fact that people now want to put money on algorithms tells you that they believe the hardware is coming and is going to be there in a short amount of time. Yes, error correction is important for some problems. It is not important in its full extent for all problems. Mm. And the in simple intuition for you, the world of physical materials has imperfections, otherwise known as errors. And the world still works. So which problems also can be scaled even bigger before we get to the world of full error correction, I think is going to be an important area. 
And now for those interested in IBM's Granite model, here are the remaining slides and presentation delivered at the AI Action Summit in Paris. And, you know, we've been optimizing right now on the, on the, the sort of small scale, 8 billion parameters and below. Where they can fit on a single GPU, they actually run locally uh, pretty well. And we, we even have models that scale down to the point where they work on mobile devices. And then for our next generation models, we're going all the way up to, you know, 100 billion parameters up and beyond with mixture of expert models. And that kind of, uh, you know, is just giving people more of a range. But we think that that small range is actually, as much as people get excited about some of the capabilities of these really big models, um, you know, that can be very expensive to run, we think that for an enterprise to actually deploy some of these solutions, those smaller models are much more of a sweet spot in cost today. The other thing I, I want to point out, too, is that every year, um, if you look at the, the, the actual capabilities of a 70 billion parameter model last year, or even nine months ago, versus an 8 billion parameter model today, we're actually continually packing down more and more capability as the whole field gets better at every part of this process of making these models. So we think that that's kind of going to be a sweet spot lane uh, for lots of people to work in for a long time. We were actually, one of the reasons why we wanted to have our own models was because we want to infuse these in all of our products. They're currently infused into, you know, 20 plus products at IBM. And to even consider indemnifying them, we have to have a level of control and transparency that we weren't able to get consistently in the market. But we're also releasing them with tools like these Guardian models, which is a, a trend that others, like Meta does this with, with LlamaGuard, um, where there's increasing awareness that a model isn't just a model by itself. You need to have guardrail models around it. You might want to have, you probably need to have embedding models to do rag search, uh, vector searches of content. It'd be great if those embedding models were designed to work with the model you're working with, which is the case of what we're doing with Granite. And, you know, it's, it's a whole suite of tools. It takes a sort of a village of models to be able to do things. So I'm, I'm going to step in just a little bit on what these are. So we have uh, 3.1 series came out, uh, you know, a couple months ago. We're having 3.2 coming out uh, next month. And these are just sort of standard state-of-the-art models. So I, I, the main conjecture here I'm going to make is that all of that transparency and being open about the data and being very careful about the legal clearances of the data and all of that doesn't necessarily doesn't need to com compromise quality. It's uh, we've at various points have heard like oh only a social media company can do this because they have social media data and that somehow is getting in the model and that's how they're doing it or oh you need to break these rules if you want to do this. It, it turns out it's not true like you know, across a wide range of benchmarks you know some cases we're a little bit better, some cases we're a little bit worse, but, you know, we're, we're, we can produce a model in a way that's completely transparent, completely open, that's that's toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with a, a wide range of models. Uh, and we can do that while being, you know, highly transparent. So this is a transparency index from Stanford. Uh, this was actually uh, for a previous generation that wasn't even open source, so we're hoping our numbers will be bigger next year. Um, but it, it just fits into this trend of, you know, lots of open things being available. We think that level of choice is great. And then we can focus on the things that are important for us. So we can, you know, make sure that um, the, mo the models are safe. You know, we can score highly on a variety of different safety benchmarks. So that's important to our customers. And then we can tailor it to enterprise use cases. And this is really where I'm going to get to, like, sort of the content, like, the message of beyond open is good. Why is open good? And why, is, why, why would we want to especially focus on these kind of smaller models with, with good capabilities tailored to, to use case. Um, I want to direct you to that last uh, chart, which is uh, performance benchmarks on real world cybersecurity benchmarks. And this is a place where we put a fair bit of work into Granite, and it performs better both on public benchmarks, but also especially on our own internal IBM security benchmarks that they produce, because we put work into it to tailor it and take the expertise of our cybersecurity experts and distill it into the models. And I think this idea that, that that by having an open ecosystem where we have lots of choice, what that lets people do is it lets experts and you know domain experts to, to take the models, customize them, give the community a wider variety of differentiated models for different capabilities. We're not saying we're going to have the model that only can do one thing. We're just saying we're going to you know our recipe for for um, ratatouille might be different than another restaurant's recipe for ratatouille, and we were, we're catering to different clientele, and our clientele is, is enterprise.